<laughs> Miss Bell is here. She's our reading interventionist, and she also teaches reading recovery for just first grade in our classroom. So she um, is going to hopefully teach us some stuff and strategies to use with our kids. Yep. Yeah. Perfect. All right. I will get started. Um, I'm Lorna Bell. I, as Mrs. Abwaite was saying, I teach reading recovery and literacy intervention um, here at Brendel. This is my first year in this position. Um, so a little bit about me. I taught kindergarten for six years, um, four years at a charter school, and then um, transitioned here to Brendel. And um, last year, Mrs. Getz approached me and said, hey, I have a great opportunity for you. I'm like, okay, okay. So coming from her, that was huge because I admire her very, very much, especially when it comes to literacy. And I wrote that part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was like, I admire her. Right? Um, but she really came to me about this whole reading and recovery thing. And I had heard about it from um, past teachers, but I never really understood what it was. I never had really seen what it was. I didn't really know too much research behind it. And so what it is, as um, a person in training, I go to class every Thursday. So every Thursday for three hours up at the uh, GISD. And I, through my class, we teach what we call behind the glass. And it's basically like a two-way mirror and um, it's from educators all around Genesee County, and we all have to do it. But what happens is that on the other side of the glass, um, my colleagues are there talking while I'm teaching, but I can't hear them, can't see them. They can see me and hear me. But they, um, they talk about how my teaching is, how I can improve upon it. And you talk about intimidating. Mm -hmm. <sighs> my very first time teaching behind the glass, I literally thought I was gonna throw up. <laughs> But what was so great about it is that afterwards we debrief. And that's really where all the learning comes together. And I tell you what, in the six, seven years that I've been teaching, reading recovery, nothing comes against it. I mean, and I know you can vouch for this as well, and this is guest reading recovery training. And um, it, every time I go to class, my mind is completely blown on all the research and new things to learn. I'm like, why didn't I learn any of this in college? Like, I, we always have that conversation of, you know, you go to college, you spend four or five years, and I'm like, I don't remember anything. <laughs> but this class has really opened my mind and really has educated myself in literacy. And um, I see myself thriving every single day as an educator, and what's awesome is that I'm seeing it with students and your students, particularly. So um, what's really nice, too, about Grand Blank is that we offer reading recovery, and not all school districts do. Um, and it's the most proven emergent um, literacy intervention, too. So it's, uh, it's a 20-week program, and then we have a second round of kids that will be starting here really quickly. So. All right, moving on. So basically why you're here today and why I was asked to present, because we wanted to start to really get that engagement at home and that joy for reading at home. Sometimes I know it's really hard. I was talking to um, some teachers who are parents, because I myself am not a parent, but I do have nieces and nephews. And I asked, how is it at <coughs> home as a parent trying to fit in reading? Like, are you able to fit it in? And I'll have conversations with colleagues saying, you know, sometimes it's just like you're in the hustle, bustle of everything, and it's really hard just to say, okay, let's sit down and read. But you have to make it a priority. If you really want your child to succeed in the world, you have to make reading a priority. I mean, there's so many connections that children can make that we're forgetting about, especially with the use of technology. We're listening to books, and which is amazing, but it's what's happening is that a lot of children are experiencing reading out loud just themselves. So they're not able to hear themselves read anymore. And so that's something that we always talk about amongst teachers is that how important it is that our kids are reading out loud as well. So I'll go over that today as well. So not to put us all on the spot, but it's really good feedback for myself is wondering what you guys do as parents at home 
home. And totally be honest, this is Vegas, like what happens here stays here, because I get life happens, and I totally understand. But we need to know as teachers and as educators, what can we do and what is going on at home? And that's the whole purpose of me being here is that, so I can take everything that you guys are saying, I can go back to my team and back to the building, and we can really try to close that gap of what's happening at home and then at school because you're not going to class Thursday to study literacy, you know, I am. But my job is to help you and to take my information and really spread it out to the um, parents here at Brindle. So just out of curiosity, anybody wants to jump out there and maybe just say like maybe your routine or what are some things that you help your child at home when they're reading, anything at all, any ideas? Yeah. Um, so we read every night. Um, I for, we do two books. One picture book, one chapter from the chapter book to so I have a fifth grader and a kindergartner, so it's like a just difference in what they want to have content wise. Um, we keep books in our car, which helps a lot. We have a bin of books in between the two car seats, which don't tell Wendy I told you guys this, don't make your sit in a booster seat. <laughs> but there, it's in between the two, and that's what, so they will read to me, because um, we actually school a choice from Fenton. So mm -hmm. we have a, about a 25 minute drive. Um, so we'll read in the, sometimes not in the morning because it's too dark, but we definitely read on the way home. And that mm -hmm. helps a lot. Yeah. Because it's time that they're just arguing otherwise. Right. <laughs> and they're kind of stuck. Like they can't go anywhere. Like, no. Like this. And then we'll literally, we just, it's either arguing, listen to Circle Round podcast, or read a book. Right. <laughs> right. No, I think that's great, especially because of that hustle bustle that I was uh -huh. talking about. Yep. I mean, from you going to one place to another, and yet they're reading at the same time. So. And I just try to make it a point to refresh the books <coughs> monthly, so they don't right. get sick of them. So. No, and that's a great thing, and that's something I'll talk about later, but I'm just going to kind of point in. Always go back to books that they have read. Like that familiar reading, we were talking about this today in Data Day, is having all, I mean, all the kids, doesn't matter what age group, having them go back to something that's familiar because that's going to boost their confidence mm -hmm. and it's going to really start them to have that joy. So, anybody else? Yes. We also read um, every evening, but for us it's mostly bedtime reading. Mm -hmm. So, we probably get a good like half hour, 40 minutes in every night of reading. Um, but, you know, we started reading with Grant when he was a new people were like, why are you bothering? Mm -hmm. Right. And they were like, no. So we just started, you know, you can hold a book or anything, but we just started. And that's okay. That's just all that he knows is mm -hmm. just being read to. Um, and about revisiting titles. So over the years, I used to read chapter books aloud to him. Well, now I'm pulling those titles back out, and I, my house, my living room is full of books, his books. And so now he's <coughs> reading those titles, remembers them, and now he's reading them himself. Mm -hmm. um, but he remembers them. From when I read them too. And also, like, we do Amazon, Amazon Book Box or Amazon. Anyways, it's two titles for his age group, and mm -hmm. they're he kind of gets to choose the box. Like, they give you some options, but they're just all kinds of random titles. And so, we just always have stacks of just books available that are fresh, mm -hmm. new. You know, I was telling Mrs. Scott's the other day, he's right now reading Charlie Thorne and the Missing Equation. And it's about a 12 year old being hired by the CIA. <laughs> Which that happens all the time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> he loves it. He can't put it down. Yeah. It's like fantastic. Yeah. So. Right. Yeah. Can, can you repeat the? It's Amazon. What yeah, is I think it? it's the Amazon Book Box, and so it's a subscription service, and so okay. you get two titles a month, and you get to choose kind of the age category, and they're generally like best-selling um, books or Newbery, like they're really great selections. Okay. Mm -hmm. And to and if you don't like yeah. the titles, they give you a preview that you can swap out the mm -hmm. titles. Again, they limit the selection. Mm -hmm. But I would say every single month, like we've ended up with cost wise? Um, I think it's twenty one dollars a month. Twenty one a month. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. they pay for them. Yeah, they're most of them they're hardcover. They're all hardcover. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, because they're newer releases, right? Yeah. So they're still the usual hardback. Yeah. They're it's mm. fantastic. Yeah, and you know, and it's his box, so he gets it every month, and he opens mm -hmm. it, and yeah. It's awesome. That makes me excited. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sarah, did you have something to say? Um, I with my kids, kind of, and was like, oh, I'm tired, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
But with my kids at home, um, I let them choose whatever they want to read. Mm-hmm. So if it's a comic book, a picture book, a graphic novel. So they have to read every day. My daughter that's in fourth grade, their only homework ever is um, reading. They don't mm-hmm. have homework. So, you know, I try to I try to encourage her to stick with. I want her to get into reading those series. But I try to get her to stick to a book and, and finish it. But I don't force her to. I just want them to enjoy reading. And my mm-hmm. kindergartner, um, he's still learning to read. So his reading might not always be a book. It might be whatever the teacher sent home. But I just want him to, them to enjoy it and to know, like, I'm right there with them. Because that's really my time with them. Mm-hmm. When we get home, it's just that reading time. So yeah. just want them to enjoy it. Yeah. yeah. One thing that I'm loving hearing already is that you guys are trying just for them just to have love for reading, you know, the interest and the time that you're putting into it. And that's what really comes all down to We it. feel like we we're not a good parent or we're not doing something right, which is not true, as Doris just said mm-hmm. in her story. But that's hard for parents because we just mm-hmm. feel that, oh, they're not, I'm not doing something right. Mm-hmm and um, it's frustrating. So I guess, you know, I see you with kids during the day and they're just, you know, they just want to perform for you. So- um, Not all of them. She has a super resistor. Like I don't, I've never had a kid as super resistant as this one guy. And Mm -hmm. she's doing everything she can to get him and reader recovery, it's one-on-one. So Mm -hmm. she has a half hour, it's expensive because you're putting a teacher for a half hour one-on-one with a student and he's super resisting. So she's trying to figure out how to woo him into working with her. I've tried. Yes. I've tried the sticker system. I've tried taking things away. I've tried rewards. I've tried teaching you know, him in my office because he sort of likes yep, me. Yep. Teaching him in the classroom <laughs> with a partner next to him. And that is finally working. Mm-hmm. I let him make, choose a friend. Now, read and recover, you're not supposed to have a friend. But I got permission, um, and that friend comes sits next to us. He doesn't do our work together, but he's there reading side by side. His best friend, he was allowed to pick one student through the whole class. And just with him sitting there, my friend is finally starting to do his work. So really, oh, it's just <coughs> persevere and don't take it personally, right? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Trust me, I was like trying to like, help me. I don't know well, what to do. And how about that exposure? You know, so listening to stories is powerful as well, right? You know, hearing stories, that repetition, being read to, hearing the inflection of voices. I mean, you kind of got to take what you can, you know, get oh, yeah. Yeah. sometimes. Um, so anyways, we're going to go into some different reading strategies that you guys can do at home. I'm going to model for you as well all of these strategies. I'm actually going to put my teacher cap on, and my voice might get really high when I read, and it might get a little crazy. But <laughs> um, so I'm just going to go over a few different strategies first, and I do have this as a hard copy if you would like one as well. Um, but I do want to go over these pretty in depth because these are so such important strategies to use at home. These are strategies that we use as well um, in the building too. So um, one thing that um, we recommend is using a tool that is connected to you, which is your finger. And um, we always want to encourage students to start to, to take that finger away to help them with reading fluently and more smoothly. Now if your child is in kindergarten or first grade, Sometimes pointing to those words um, is very helpful, but once they start to really capture that reading, we want that finger to come away so it doesn't get in the way of their reading. Um, So what we tell students to do a lot of the times is they get stuck on a word, so we say, okay, put that finger in there, where's the tricky word? Where's that tricky part for you? So we locate that tricky word. So that way they're visually seeing it and we can talk about different things that we can use to decode that word. So looking at the picture and say the first sound, something that I heard the other day and my ears cringed was that there was a parent covering up the pictures in a book. You might have done that before. I know I have done that before. But through research and what it shows, do not cover up those pictures because those are giving those students help with words. Um, It tells the meaning through the story. So never cover up those pictures. Um, Same thing too, 
when I see a student stuck on a tricky word and say, put your finger there and I'll get it started, what's that first letter, what's that first sound? Most of the time, once they get it started with that first sound, they're able to problem solve on their own. To help that, we check the word slowly. So a lot of the times we hear, sound it out, sound it out, sound it out. <laughs> what and I used to do that um, but what we've learned is that what we do we want to say it slowly because we don't talk like this right if k -at, it just doesn't make sense right um, now if we say it slowly cat you can actually understand what I'm saying so just in normal conversation we don't talk phoning by phoning or sound by sound maybe we do slow down our words but you can still understand what I'm saying so we had an example today at Data Day where one teacher was saying there's a little girl who's gotten stuck on thinking she needs to sound out. So she was saying, s ha ha a a mm -hmm. What word is that? s ha ha a a Shoo. Oh. It doesn't work. Mm -hmm. It doesn't and work. And a lot of words don't work to sound out. Mm -hmm. Especially you when chunk you chunk through them. Right. Especially when you start yeah. to get through those more complicated <laughs> words where SH says shh. Sh Mm -hmm. But you'll notice what we do every day, you'll notice students, they'll just do sound by sound by sound. And they'll sit there, and they'll sit there, and they'll sit there. And it's because they're trying to go sound by sound, and just, it does not work. So we want to try to get away from that whole sound it out, and get to saying it slowly. What do you see? Look for a part that you know. Um, Rereading. Now this is kind of more of a behavior. Um, but it's a great behavior to have because they can take meaning from the story or if they understand what word that they're saying, it can go back to the meaning of the sentence and put it all together. Um, so like I was saying, looking for parts that you know, kind of with that shoe example, the SH, and looking for those sound chunks that we see or those parts of words or the endings of words such as ING, ED, ES, what happens with a lot of students that I see on a daily basis is that they're not looking all the way through the word because we focus so hard on that first sound, that first letter, which is great because we do need to get our words started, but our eyes aren't visually going through that entire word. And so a lot of the times what I do every day is I really analyze everything a child is doing while they're reading. And part of that is what they're doing visually with words. And a lot of the time, visually, they'll get and they'll recognize that first sound, but the medial and the ending part of a word is forgotten because they're not looking. And a lot of it, we were talking about this today, that visual piece of words, and how important it is to really make sure that we're carefully looking with our eyes. Um, so moving on to once they have that word or you've solved it on your own, or even if you told them that word, which is fine, giving a told, Sometimes a lot of parents or even teachers, even myself, I'm guilty of just waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting for them to figure it out. I got news for you. They haven't said anything in a while. They don't know it and they're not going to be able to get it. So sometimes it really is okay for you just to tell them that word. Then you can use that strategy, okay, let's check it slowly with our finger and let's say it slowly. Does that sound right to you? Does that make sense to you? Does that go along with the story? So that way you're holding them responsible for really thinking on their own. Okay, the last one is does it sound like we talk? This is a tough one to really break <coughs> habits with. Um, we talk about this in my class almost every Thursday um, about making sure our reading sounds smooth and it sounds like we're having a conversation. A lot of students get in that robotic feel when they're reading because they're trying so hard just to look at every word and you'll start to see their head nod when they're reading every word and you want to ask them does that sound right to you does it sound like you're talking let's talk about okay if we're reading this story we're reading this sentence how would the character of so and so say it or how would they sound if they were saying that so that's really important too the first thing that you guys really want to focus on as parents is giving an introduction of a book Sometimes it's really easy for us, especially for a new book. Sometimes it's really easy for us to say, okay, do your 20 minutes of reading, go in the other room, I'll set the timer, or whatever it is. I know my sister is guilty of that, but. <laughs> um, 
So, but the book introduction is probably the most important piece because that's where you're going to capture their interest. That's where you're going <laughs> to really get their attention. And really what we want to do or try to do with a book introduction is to leave it with like a cliffhanger, like a question or like, hmm, I wonder what's going to happen or let's read to find out what happens. So with the book introduction, you kind of have to be an actor or an actress. And you really kind of need to go over the top with explaining with what the book is about. So when I approach a student with a new book, get my cap on, my face on, oh my gosh, look at this book that I have today. You are going to be so excited to read this book. What do you think is gonna, this book's going to be about? What do you see? I see a grandma. A grandma? Oh my goodness, and what is she doing? Looks like she's pulling on <gasps> Pulling on that? Hmm, I wonder what that could be. What is she pulling on? We should read to find out what she is pulling on and why she's pulling on that. So just kind of, I know I'm kind of on the whim here, but she, <laughs> don't laugh at me. <laughs> Doris is dying to know what's in that book. <laughs> We ask them questions about comprehension. Uh, what happened in the beginning of the story? What kind of connections did you make? Da -da 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 -da. Mm -hmm. And so you really, really want to make sure that they're understanding what they're reading. What's the purpose? What's the meaning of the story? Um, so if I were to read this story to a student, obviously I'm not reading a big book just one on one, but I wanted everybody to be able to see this. So we notice a few things. Right? So as a parent, I would go ahead, before I even start reading, I would maybe pick one or two things that you know might be tricky for a kid to figure out. So just by looking at this, what's maybe one thing that you might do as a parent to kind of guide your child into reading this page? Anything? What's she picking up on the ground? What is she picking up on the ground? Okay. I would always help with the names because they have a, kids have a hard yes. time with names. Yeah. So when it's um, a book with different characters, you really want to emphasize that before you even start. Oh, guess what? This grandma's name is actually Old Mother Hubbard, and she is known in a lot of books that we read. So once we get here, hmm, Old Mother Hubbard. Let's think about that. Old. Old. What do you think old might start with? Oh, oh, hmm. I want you to find the word old up here. It's somewhere up here, but I want you to look with your eyes. Old. Oh, old. And so there comes that slow check. Old, because it looks the same. The word is one, if you can't see. Looks the same, right? But that's where it's really hard for kids to see that middle and ending of that word. Hmm. Let's check to see if that's old. Old. Notice I said it slowly. I didn't sound it out. Old. Hmm. Does that look right? Does that sound right? No. Okay. Let's find the word old. Hmm. Old. Old. I said it slowly, we're looking with our eyes. Does that look right? Does that make sense to you? Does that look right? Yes! Oh, we know it's right because it ends with that duh. So if you notice when I said let's look for the word old, I really made sure I emphasize that duh. Old. So that way they can hear it and see it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna read a couple pages as if I were a parent even a teacher too. But again, we wanna make sure that we're really instilling that joy for reading. 
One day, old Mother Hubbard went to the cupboard, but it was bare. So she planted a little watermelon seed in the garden. Each day, old Mother Hubbard looked at the watermelon. Grow, little watermelon, she said. Grow big and sweet and juicy. And the watermelon grew and grew and grew until it was, and I'll stop there. But what did you notice that I did with my voice? Lots of intonation. So much intonation. I overdid it, but that's okay, right? I mean, that gets those kids so excited and intrigued. I mean, I know even if I'm sitting somewhere and somebody's reading me a story and they're not having any expression whatsoever, not even on their face, I'm out, like, <laughs> bye, I'm doing something else, I'm doodling. Um, so it's so important at home. I know we're tired, I know it's such a long day, but if you are a parent that you really want your child to succeed in reading, you have to put on that actor actress face and show them that you love reading too. So, any questions about that part really quickly? No? Okay, so I'm gonna end us here for a second. I'm gonna um, have a quick video. This is probably one of the best videos out there that really instills um, reading at home and helping parents with different strategies and um, what to do at home. So we'll let this play. It is kind of longer, but it's really good information. Hi, this is Jennifer Gonzalez for Cult of Pedagogy. If you have a child between kindergarten and grade two, it's likely that that child's teacher has assigned about 10, 20, or 30 minutes of reading per night for homework. In this video, we're gonna talk about what parents and other caregivers can do to make sure this homework really helps your child become a better reader. The first thing you should do is sit side by side with your child while they read. Although it's really tempting to try to get other work done, the point of this homework is to have an adult following along. When you sit side by side, you can watch the words as she reads them. This allows you to give her immediate feedback when she needs it. Number two is don't tell the words. To learn how to decode words on her own, a child needs lots of time to wrestle with them. If you jump in to tell her what the words are, she'll miss the learning that comes from that struggle. Sometimes all you have to do is wait quietly, giving her time to figure a word out. The snake. Charmer. Good, yeah. Sits in the front of a basket and begins to play a flute. Number three, move beyond sound it out. Just trying to sound out a word letter by letter is not the most effective way to figure out what the word is. There are tons of strategies for decoding a word. One way is to think about similar words. If she's trying to read the word rake, point out that it has a lot of the same letters as the word cake, a word she already knows. That can help her guess the right pronunciation for rake. Chunking is another strategy breaking the word into bigger chunks rather than trying to sound out each individual letter. Finally, allow your child to use the pictures in the book to make a guess. Never cover up the pictures when your child is reading. They're important tools to help her figure out words independently. You can also try covering up part of a word to see if your child can read the other part first. Is the cobra really dancing to the music? No, it can't even hear it. Snakes have no. Oh, I didn't. <laughs> you stuck on that word? You took off the end of the word. Out. That's out. And then outer. Outer. Good. Ears. Number four, have your child reread some passages for fluency. If your child is merely sounding out individual words, she won't really get the meaning of a sentence. For the words to make sense together, they need to be read smoothly. So if your child takes a while to get through a particular sentence, have her go back and reread it so it makes more sense. A long time ago, sailors thought these meant that someone was going to die. Good. Now we've kind of slowed down right there, so let's try to smooth the sentence out. A long time ago, sailors, sailors thought 
this, not that someone was going to die. Much nicer that time. Just be careful not to overdo it. Asking your child to repeat dozens of sentences in one session will drive her crazy. A few times is enough. And if she's struggling through most of every page, it's probably not the right book for her. Choose an easier one or tell the teacher that she's struggling at this level. Number five, allow some mistakes to go uncorrected. It's not necessary to correct every single error your child makes. His head That's actually two words pushed together. Headdress. Yeah. Had the golden cobra on it. Because the child is working hard to get the word headdress right, and then puts a lot of concentration into golden cobra, pointing out that she said the when she should have said a uh, would be too much of a distraction. Once she gets the more difficult words down, you can be more picky about making sure she reads all the words right. Number six, allow your child to read the same book multiple times. If she reads a book on Monday and wants to read the same one again on Tuesday, that's okay. With each successive read, she'll get better and better at building her fluency. And by the end of the week, she should easily recognize words she struggled with at the beginning. Finally, you should keep reading to your child. Just because your child is learning how to read on her own, it doesn't mean she can't still learn a lot from listening to you read. By continuing to read to her for pleasure, you model correct pacing, reading with expression, and a love of books that will help make her a lifelong reader. But, um, so thank you. My classroom door is always open all the time. Um, I hope, I'm sure you probably know that, Mrs. Bonner. Mm -hmm. um, feel free though, honestly, to contact me with anything ever, um, even if it's just simple games to do to help with sight words, or if it's different reading strategies, or if you want to come and watch me anytime. Um, my door is always open. So. Lorna, of all those strategies, um, which one of those um, also helps with the comprehension, not only reading the words, but then understanding what it's saying. When we're asking them if it sounds right or makes sense, I okay. would say. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that's where they're going to lose that meaning of the story. Got it. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it.